It's crossover Thursday here on the Locked On Podcast Network, which means the Steelers get to talk to the Bills. I've got Joe Marino from Locked On Bills. It's going to be a fun, exciting time. We've got questions to ask each other. Let's just get right into it. You are Locked On Steelers, your daily Pittsburgh Steelers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter, bringing you your daily dose of all things in the Pittsburgh Steelers. As always, you can find this show on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, and now YouTube. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. It really helps us out. Leave us with a five-star rating, rating with a positive comment on Apple Podcasts, and you get a shout-out at the, at the end of the show. Today, joining me for a Locked On crossover, our first crossover Thursday episode of the season, Locked On Steelers meets Locked On Bills. I, Chris Carter of the Locked On Steelers podcast, I'm sitting here with Joe Marino of Locked On Bills. Joe, we did this last year. It was a lot of fun. I'm glad we get to do this again, buddy. Yeah, Chris, always a pleasure talking football with you. And, um, you know, these teams, it's what, three years in a row now that these teams are going to face each other. And so it's been fun to kind of talk through the – I guess, renewed rivalry, if you will, a little bit here, not too far down the road. So the Mike Tomlin, Sean McDermott dynamics are are always fun to get into. And, uh, you know, a couple of uh, teams that have high hopes for this year. Absolutely. The Bills, you know, on the cusp, of they're just very close to the Super Bowl last year. Uh, both teams, obviously, playoff teams, both teams, you know, important in their divisions. Uh, it, it's really interesting to see how they're going. But the main aspect of the Bills, and I want to start with my first question to you, Joe, about the obvious guy in the room, Josh Allen. You know, everyone saw how he just took a serious step forward. But, you know, clearly he's the star of the team. And after making serious strides last year, getting his first Pro Bowl season and all that, how have you seen him working leading up to this season? Do you see last season as like, this is the Josh Allen that we're going to see and it's going to be phenomenal? Or there were like several things left in his game that you're like, man, if he cleans these things up, he can be better. And now maybe you're seeing some of those things in training camp and preseason. Well, the the Bills certainly believe that the 2020 Josh Allen is the Josh Allen, right, with the contract that they gave him. And so um, you've heard Coach McDermott talk about that and, and Josh Allen. And Josh Allen has said, look, they didn't pay me for what I've done. They're paying me for what I'm going to do. And so um, the expectation is for Josh Allen to continue the caliber of play that we saw last year that made him uh, number two in the NFL MVP voting. And so – that's that's the expectation. And the thing about Josh Allen and having studied him closely, dating back to 2016, really at Wyoming, uh, covering him for the draft and then goes to the Bills. And so I've continued to stay pretty connected to what's going on with Josh Allen is he's always embraced a growth mindset. He's mm-hmm. been very honest about things that he has to work on and he's worked on them. And so while some people may say that he came out of nowhere last year to have the season that he did, Truth be told, it's it's been an ascending thing right. where he's really identified areas of his game that he has to improve upon, and he he's done that. And that didn't stop this year. When he was asked about the things that he's been working, working on back in the OTAs, I mean, he was very specific about throws to his left and being more consistent with ball placement on in-breaking routes mm. and becoming more of a student of the game and making sure that mechanics are, are where they're supposed to be. And so he, he continues to work really hard in the off-seasons. He's got Jordan Palmer as his personal quarterback's coach. And they've worked some magic together. They've fixed some things about Josh Allen that I didn't think think would be fixable when you talk about decision-making, reading defenses, processing mechanics, being able to be consistent with ball placement when all of your process isn't necessarily able to be what you want it to be, which happens in the NFL where you have to speed things up from time to time when pressure right. comes around you. So I think jo- Josh Allen is, is, is an ultimate grinder, and um, I think that he's continued to prove that he's going to work and ascend. And I guess I'm just excited to find out what's next. What's the 2021 version of Josh Allen and what areas of his game are we going to be able to point to that continue to show this growth that we've seen for so many years now? I'm excited to see it too. I mean, he was phenomenal last year and such a fun talent to watch. Uh, I, I actually asked Joe Schobert, new Steelers linebacker they traded for uh, from Jacksonville, 
uh, about Josh Allen because he played him when he was a rookie. And I asked, like, what are some of the things you've seen that are different? He talked about, man, ball placement is a completely different game. He's like, before, he was an athletic gunslinger. And, you know, we had to watch out for him. But, he, you know, accuracy wasn't his strong point. Now it is. And he's like, even when it wasn't, he said there was a time where I knew I saw his eyes lock on to his receiver and I went after the ball and I dove for the ball and the ball got to the man before I could even get there. And it was like that was how what he was as a rookie. So he knows that this man's on another level at this point in his career. Uh, so definitely very interesting stuff. You know, I want to see how Josh Allen works this season. I mean, that preseason game against the Packers, he looked he looked phenomenal, I thought. Yeah, he did. And and I think that was our first little taste in uh, of uh, of Josh, obviously, and for anybody that was doubting, right, that 2020 was a fluke in that, you know, how is he going to look when there's people in the stands? Well, there's 50,000 people in the stands in Buffalo, and he went out <laughs> and looked as good as we've ever seen him. And so I think that was a nice little nugget of hope for anybody that was doubting that, you know, 2020 was an anomaly for Josh Allen. Absolutely. Now, sticking with the offense, he had a strong connection with Stephon Diggs, worked in some Gabriel Davis, got Cole Beasley in there and Dawson Knox. But now Manuel Sanders, a former Steelers receiver, is listed as a starter on the depth chart. Who do you see as actually his second favorite target behind Diggs? Is it already going to be Sanders? Is it still Cole Beasley as the slot guy? Or is Gabriel Davis, who I saw as a developing deep threat in the NFL last year, working his way in there? Yeah, I think you can make a pretty strong case for all of those guys, but I think it'll be Cole Beasley. Uh, you know, it's it's third and Beasley as uh, as we call it in Buffalo, but um, you know, I, I think that after Diggs, Beasley's going to get his his share of looks, and I think Beasley's such an important player for Josh Allen and the Bills' offense because it helps Josh keep things on schedule, right? And, and sometimes, you know, Josh is an ultimate competitor, and there are times where you just feel like he tries to do a little more than is necessary. I think Cole Beasley is definitely that. Uh, if you want to call it calming presence in the lineup that if if the the progression's not going where Josh wants it to go, you know, he's exhausted his reads, he knows Cole Beasley's going to be open and he can dump it down to him and he'll catch right. a football and he'll turn it into a first down and, you know, a very low drop rate. I think he was just at about 2% last year. So I think that consistency uh, warrants targets and I think he's very important for Josh Allen's overall process. But you mentioned Gabe Davis uh, had a really good rookie year as a fourth round pick. He'll get plenty of looks. And Emmanuel Sanders is the player that Brandon Bean's been after for a while. When Denver sent him to San Francisco, Brandon Bean tried to trade for him then, but mm. Denver didn't want to trade him within the conference. So he finally gets his guy, and he really fits this mold that the Bills are looking for at wide receiver, where it's about versatility. You can play multiple spots, but you're also a really good route runner, right? And, he, and so the Bills just have this embarrassment of riches when it comes to guys that can run stellar routes with Diggs, Beasley, Sanders, and Puts a lot of pressure on defenses, and I think that you know Beasley's going to be that number two. But I think Sanders could challenge for ninety to one hundred targets, and you know Gabe Davis is going to get his as well. One thing you know is that the Bills are going to throw the football, right? I mean, yeah, yes. they came out in that preseason game, threw it seventeen times in a row, right? I mean, they, they they've done that so many different times, and so there's there's one football, but uh, the Bills are going to throw it a ton. Absolutely. Now let's switch to defense. The Bills run defense seemed inconsistent at times last year. They finished 18th in the NFL, but they've got Ed Oliver up front. They've got Jerry Hughes in the edge. They got Tremaine Edmonds, a, a, a linebacker. What have you seen from them out of camp in the preseason? Is this something that you expect to be improved in 2021? Yeah, I would say that run defense isn't something that I look at on this Bills football team and feel like it's an overly strong area of the team. Okay. And I think the you know Starla Tule he opted out last year he's the Bills starting one technique a big part of what they do uh, with run defense and I think not having him last year was a pretty big deal because now you're face you're forcing guys that are typically three techniques like Ed Oliver like Quentin Jefferson and they're playing nose for you now that's not Starla Tule he's back in the lineup this year and I think that his presence in the lineup is going to mean a lot for the Bills run defense in terms of allowing Matt Milano and Tremaine Edmonds to play downhill and not have to deal with so much contact and obviously he's not going to get moved off his spot and he's going to anchor and take up blocks and be where he's supposed to be in the run game and so I think his presence back on the lineup should help but I will be honest with you I don't think it's a strong suit of the football team I think that the mm. Bills are going to give up some 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 yards on the ground this year and and I think they're okay with that I think the Bills are definitely a team that are is designing its defense to to get negative plays, to get sacks, to get takeaways. And if they give up some yards from time to time, that's fine, but they're going to tighten the screws down in the red zone, and they're going to dare you to stack play after play after play after play against a really good, fundamentally sound defense and see if you can score points. So 
I, I again, I, I don't think it's a, a kiss of death, their run defense. I just don't think it's something that's necessarily we're going to look at this Bills defense and this Bills football team and feel like run defense is one of the strengths of the team. No, I feel you. But I mean, like you said, when you have a secondary that's led by Tredavious White and you got guys like Jordan Poirier and Michael Michael Hyde working as a tandem and safety, um, you know, that that affords you the opportunity to say, hey, you don't have to win all the the, the run the rundowns because you got the guys in the passing game that are going to help you, along with, you know, of course, Tremaine Edmonds helping you patrol the middle of the field. But I wanted to talk to you about that secondary because I saw some things on the depth chart that I was like, whoa. Now, first of all, being a guy who covers Pitt, I see Dane Jackson, I see DeMar and Hamlin, I'm like, oh, okay, H2P, those guys. But the Bills have two nickel cornerbacks listed on their depth chart, and only Dane Jackson listed as the outside cornerback to either Tredavious White or Levi Wallace. Um, is the former pit cornerback really the only option there if someone gets hurt? And how do you see that depth behind White at, at cornerback playing out? Yeah, so it's it's interesting when you talk about this Bills secondary. They got really good starters everywhere, but I would agree with you that the depth – is something to be mindful of. And they chose to go thin at corner. They're only rostering five corners. They're only rostering four safety. So nine total defensive backs. I mean, you look at the Miami Dolphins, they've got 13, you know? So <laughs> you're, I'm a little surprised myself that Sean McDermott, who is a, you know, a college defensive back, and you can tell he really spends a lot of time with the safeties and the corners and the nickel players, uh, that the Bills don't roster more. Now, they do have three on the practice squad in terms of sa- of, uh, of corners that they could – call up any given week and guys with experience in the system like Cam Lewis. But for the most part, yeah, I would say that they didn't prioritize cornerback depth. And I think that is number one, a testament to the belief in the starters that they have. You talk about Tredavious White, Levi Wallace opposite of him, Taron Johnson in the slot with Poyer and Hyde as your safeties. Those guys have been together since 2017. And and that's a lot of time together. That's a lot of consistency. That's a lot of communication that is really, really sharp and guys understanding how other players are going to play off of each other and coverage spacing and how to react to certain route combinations. And so I think they're very comfortable with what they have in terms of their starters. And, you know, they've been a really good pass defense for a number of years with that group together. So it's definitely a boat of confidence in what they have in the starting lineup. But Chris, I'd be lying if I didn't admit to you that I was a little bit nervous when it comes to depth at at corner in, in particular, where you're a snap away from it being Dane Jackson and Levi Wallace as your starting outside corners. So uh, the Bills need 27 Trey White to make sure he stays healthy all year long. You hear that, Steelers fans? Other teams have depth chart problems too. Trust me, Joe. All see is all off. He's like, oh man, what if what if Joe Hayden goes down? Like, yeah, what if Tre'Davious White goes down? What if Jalen Ramsey goes down? Yeah. Everybody has those problems. It's not unique to any any one team, but uh, but it is interesting uh, to to hear that from the Bills' perspective. A team that you know, ever a lot of people, including myself, are picking to be you know one of the top two. If they, you know, if if not, you know. The, the one seed battling with with the Chiefs, the two were at worst the three seed in the AFC uh, after how they looked last year. And something that Mike Tomlin brought up in his press conference on Tuesday, he brought up how a lot of those guys have been together for a very long time, and that's how you get continuity. That's how you get a group that knows how to play together and how to win together and how to overcome obstacles together. So certainly something that can be interesting. Joe, I'm going to get your questions on me as, as, as the Locked On Steelers host after this break. But first, got to talk to our friends at Manscaped. Attention gamblers and of all shapes and sizes, our friends at Manscaped have, have a can't-miss bet for you today. The leaders in, in male grooming just launched their fourth-generation performance package. The betting odds are in your favor when you use the lawnmower 4.0 across the board. This is the package to get you in the mood for wherever your gambling heart desires. Ready to take the leap to male grooming royalty? Two million men already have. Join the Manscaped movement by going to manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping with the code locked on. That's L O C K E D O N, all capital letters, all one word. Again, get 20% off plus free shipping with the code locked on, L O C K E D O N, at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code locked on at manscaped.com. Fellas, don't gamble on shaving your balls with the wrong tools. Choose Manscaped. Your balls will thank you. Joe Marino, the host of Locked On Bills, joined now by Chris Carter, host of the Locked On Steelers podcast. And, and Chris, I know you've probably talked a lot about Ben Roethlisberger, the Steelers quarterback on Locked On <laughs> Steelers, but for the Locked On Bills listeners that maybe aren't quite up to speed on what's going on with Big Ben, 
I want to start there. What 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 have you seen from Big Ben in terms of this offseason? Where do you think he's at? And what do you think he's capable of entering his, what is it, 17th or 18th season as a Steelers starting quarterback? We've lost count. It's in the high teens. We know that. That's about it. Uh, But I will say this about Ben Roethlisberger. There there has been a sense that Ben Roethlisberger, from the national media perspective, that Ben Roethlisberger is finito, done, you know, just get him out of here. He's an old man, can't throw the ball anymore. That's not the case, though, in Pittsburgh. Uh, you, You saw early last season he was able to get the ball deep, but something he brought up as far as why his arm started to go late last season is he said he threw thousands of passes before minicamp even last year because he had to rehab his arm with that elbow surge that he got you know in the uh, during the 2019 season he had to work back to get all the muscles working in his arm to be normal again and he did get to that point but by the end of the season his arm was just completely toast because he threw you know more passes in the offseason than he would during the season um so that was an issue that he ran into last year and this year he's like this was a normal preparation. My arm feels fine. I can get the ball down the field. And we've seen that in practices and in, in preseason. Uh, in the one game that he played, the, every time he was on the field, they were scoring touchdowns. They were moving the ball except for one drive. They, they But back-to-back drives, he was just moving them down the field, completed, a, I think it was a 43-yard bomb uh, down the field to Deontay Johnson. He's not afraid to throw the deep ball. That's still part of his game. It's not the same zip that it was, you know, maybe 10 years ago, but it's still there. He can still also complete the intermediate passes 20 yards down the field, uh, you know, you know, that, and put those on more of a line. Uh, the biggest thing for Ben Roethlisberger, I think, though, is that he is in a much different situation with the people around him. Traditionally, over the past 10 years, he's had star guys around him, whether it was Le'Veon Bell and Antonio Brown or an offensive line like Marquise Pouncey, David DeCastro, and guys that had tons of experience in the NFL. That's all gone, and now he's 38 years old, and now you have an offensive line with Two rookie starters in Kendrick Green at center, Dan Moore Jr. at left tackle, a second-year player in Kevin Dotson, a fourth-year player in Chikuma Korfor, and a veteran they signed in free agency in Trey Turner. So it's going to be really gelling with that crew, along with a rookie running back in Najee Harris that I think are his biggest challenges. But Ben, this year, honestly... This seems to me like a year where he's kind of looking at the big picture a lot more than he has been, I'd say, than compared to maybe four or five years ago when, you know, when he was in trouble, Antonio Brown, where you at? I'm going to throw it to you, Uh, you know, but now I've seen him process a lot more, take things in a little bit more. And I think that's he kind of realizes, hey, I can't be a gunslinger, kind of like how Josh Allen's doing at a much younger age. But I'm not the gunslinger anymore. I need to be the, the, the smart guy who figures out where I'm going before the ball's even snapped. And I, I, I want to see how he does that this year because he, he started to do it last year until his arm started to mess with him. I want to see how he does when he feels comfortable in his arm the entire season. Now, you mentioned a lot of new around Ben Roethlisberger, and that includes this year a new offensive coordinator in yes. Matt Canada. He was a quarterback's coach last year and then a longtime college offensive coordinator with a number of spots uh, stops along the way. So as you've watched this team practice, if you've seen them in, in preseason, as you've heard Matt Canada talk and the players talk, what are some of your expectations as to what the offense is going to look like in 2021? Well, it's funny because the Steelers actually got a preview of Matt Canada when he was the offensive coordinator at Pitt, and they share the same training facility. So literally, I mean, like today I was at uh, or Wednesday, I was at Steelers practice, and there's Pitt players who kind of wait after their practice and watch the Steelers practice because they want to see what an NFL environment is like. And that's how close they are. They're like they're right on top of each other. And Matt Canada, I mean, if you watched him in college, uh, if you ever want to get a sense of how crazy his college offenses were, watch the 2016 uh, Clemson Pitt game when Pitt beat Clemson with the only team to beat Deshaun Watson's Clemson Tigers that year. And uh, they did it with all sorts of motion and off balance offenses and catching people off guard. It's not going to look like that for the Steelers, but what he's doing is he's bringing a lot of pre-snap motion. In, and that's not something that Randy Feetner, the prior offensive coordinator wanted to incorporate. There's going to be a lot more play action. There's going to be a, a lot more moving guys to create those unbalanced line because that will be part of their, their, their game. I expect, but I will I will say this: the running game is going to be a major feature for the Pittsburgh Steelers this year. Last year, they ranked dead last in yards per carry and overall rushing yards. That was something that Art Rooney Jr. said we will not be having this happen again. Uh, you, know, you know, for the Pittsburgh Steelers, and uh, that that you know, kind of resounded across because now Marquise Pouncey retired, David DeCastro, a free agent, Alejandro Villanueva, he's a Raven. They went and got Trey Turner. They drafted Lyman. And these are guys that, despite getting in the middle rounds, they have surprised, but they've also been were guys that they felt 
were high quality guys that they could wait on. And so uh, Kendrick Green, he measures almost exactly as Marquise Pouncey when you look at 6'4 and his weight. Um, you know, Dan Moore Jr., when we when we asked Mike Tomlin about him, he's like, man, that guy came up with a much higher floor than we expected him to have as a rookie. And that's why he took over the left tackle spot uh, for, the, for the Steelers to start the, to start the season. We'll see how that goes in these early weeks. But um, the, the, Matt Canada is going to be using these guys to have a more balanced look for the offense late in the season last year. I mean, Randy Feetner even admitted at one point, I gave up running the football because James Conner was hurt and Benny Snow was hurt and Jalen Samuels was man. They weren't so sure about Anthony McFarland, but that's where they went and got Najee Harris. They, but they believe in him. They like how Benny Snell has progressed. They like Kalen Balaj as a backup option. Those two guys will be the first two off the bench, but they're going to love getting the ball to Najee Harris. If he's healthy, expect a healthy dose of him in this game to balance out the offense. So it sounds like, and this is something that we talked about on Lockdown Bills yesterday, Pittsburgh's going to get the ball to Najee Harris. I mean, that's a pretty loud statement when you pick him in the first round, especially coming off of how poor the rush offense was last year. And, it's interesting because they do have a lot of new offensive line pieces, right. but one thing that I will say about last year's offensive line that did include, you know, the likes of David DeCastro and Marquise Pouncey, those guys weren't the same players that we've seen in years past. And no. so just because there's new names here, it doesn't necessarily signal a drop off because it played at a pretty poor level last year. And I'm guessing that the hope here is that with some fresh faces, with a new scheme, and some youth, right? I mean, some talented young players. I, I like Dan Moore. I like Kendrick Green. The Lockdown Bills listeners will tell you. I hope that the Bills drafted Kendrick <laughs> Green. He, he was a former wrestler. A lot of the a lot of the mm -hmm. boxes that the that the Bills typically like in the players they go after. But I, I think that we can, on one hand, have some level of concern over this new offensive line, but also simultaneously recognize that this offensive line wasn't good last year. So, I, what is your confidence level that this kind of comes together? and elevates to the point where it's where it needs to be for the Steelers to be able to score more points and be more consistent offensively this year. Well, honestly, you know, some people are thinking like, well, they're not going to be where they were in the mid 2010s to be top five. I'm like, no, no one's asking them to be. Right. If they are, say, if they are, you know, you know, it's tough to quantify how ranking offensive lines unless you're using PFF grades. But, you know, when you're looking at this, if they play to the level of, say, the 23rd to 20th best offensive line in the league, that'll be fine. I think the Steelers will be like, you know what? We'll take that because the receiving game's pretty good. We got this dynamic running back we're excited for. The Steelers will be excited to see those, to those things. So that's how I see their perspective on this. But something to, to, to note here, the Steelers offensive line coach, uh, Adrian Clem, new coach this year, uh, taking over for Sean Serrett. He has emphasized since the day he walked in the door, uh, you know, saying we are going to be a more physical offensive line. He's he said that time and time again, and the players have echoed it. Kevin Dotson, who for my money is the best uh, Steelers lineman this, this this year with that left guard, he talked about it early in minicamp. He's like, that's the emphasis is to be physical, get off the ball. And something that was revealed to us was last year with the uh, with the Pittsburgh Steelers when they would run block. Oftentimes, their their job, what they were being told to uh, to do, sort of sort of protect the health of these older offensive linemen like the. Castro, like Pouncey, like Villanueva, was to get your initial punch, to get your initial pop, and seal. Not drive. Don't push the guy down the field. Just seal him off in a direction and let them work. And part of that's also because that's what Le'Veon Bell, all, all, that's all he used to need. So there wasn't that transition to, hey, this needs to be more of a power running offense. And that is gone. They are These guys are physical. Kevin Dotson is, is, is pushing guys down the field. Dan Moore Jr. is doing the same. Kendra Green loves being physical. Trey Turner, that's that's his, that's his MO as well. Uh, Chikuma Korfor, the starting right tackle for now, at, while Zach Banner still still on IR rehabbing his knee injury. Um, uh, Chukumo, he's probably the guy that fits that bill the least. He's always been a little bit more passive, but he's more technically sound in, in pass protection. So it's interesting to see this group operate this way. The biggest obstacle for me, uh, Joe, is going to be gelling together. You know, the, the 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 timing of when do we chip to the backer? When do we double team in this situation? Those were things that Marquise Bouncy, he would look down the line 
and the left tackle Alan Hunter for the way would know what he's looking at him for. They were he would just say a word, and the whole line would know what assignments they needed to get. That chemistry won't be there this year. So they're in in a hostile environment like the like the Bills, uh, you know, um, like like the Bills in Orchard Park. That's going to be a place where your silent counts, your your communication. That's going to be difficult. That's going to be a challenge. That's where I see the biggest holdup for this offensive line. If they get to say week eight and that and that problem's been solved. I look for them to be a very good group, but right now I see them more of a group that the Steelers just have to work on managing to get to the next point. Chris, break down this Steelers secondary for us. I mean, obviously Minka Fitzpatrick, he's an elite player, Joe Hayden, a top corner, but when you think about this Bills offense and their willingness to go 10 personnel, their willingness to go empty and really spread you out and make it a space game. I I think we all know that the Steelers front seven is exceptional. One of the best in the NFL. But the back seven, when you get beyond Hayden, you get beyond Fitzpatrick, Sutton's a nice player, right? Edmonds kind of a downhill type safety. Mm. What what are you what are you expecting here from this group in terms of how they're going to match up with how the Bills are going to spread them out and how do you think they're going to fare? What I'm going to say right now is watch out for versatility. It's all we've been hearing throughout this offseason. Cam Sutton, a guy that can play the slot and play outside. They've gotten this guy, James Pierre, who flashed a little bit in the playoffs last year with like 12 snaps where he looked kind of good and people were like, oh, but then he came in mini camp and training camp, played very well, looked good in the preseason. They're going to be using him on the outside in some of their nickel and dime packages while they've moved Cameron Sutton around. But they also really like rookie safety Trey Norwood as a guy, uh, seventh round pick out of Oakland. Oklahoma led all of college football with interceptions last year, but he was getting after it. One thing that's been told to us by Mike Tomlin is that he is a, he has learned how to communicate at a high level very quickly. They are comfortable with him being the backup to make a Fitzpatrick. I'm I'd look to kind of see where he lines up because he might you know, they might move him to the slot on occasion for certain packages. But they also like Arthur Mollett, a guy they signed off of the Jets in free agency. Just guys that are moving around to try and take on certain roles. Now the key is. This is going to be a lot of their guys, you know, Trey Norwood, James Pierre, Arthur Mollett. These are going to be guys that are figuring out those roles. That's not going to be easy. But the Steelers are banking on, hey, you know what? Didn't have Joe Hayden last year when you played when you played the Bills. Uh, you know, you got Cam Sutton being a number two, you know, number two there or the first slot option. That might do better. But Minka Fitzpatrick, you know what he brings to the table. You know he can help you in different spots. Terrell Edmonds, a responsible guy, a big physical guy who can help against tight ends. You have those options there, but there's going to be a lot of young guys like James Pierre, like Trey Norwood, new guys like Arthur Mollette that will be that will be getting tested in this game. And I think that's where you're going to see the depth of the Bills receiving game really get an opportunity to shine. But I will also say this last year when Devin Bush went down, the Steelers had to throw in a whole bunch of extra dime packages that kind of made the inside linebacker position a moot point in the passing game. That won't be the case this year. Expect Devin Bush and Joe Schobert, the guy they traded for from the Jaguars, to um to, to be a factor in the passing game, to help over the middle of the field, both with stuffing the run, but also covering the passing game and spying on quarterbacks as athletic as Josh Allen. Last question I have for you, Chris, is as you consider this matchup on Sunday, on the road in Buffalo, I think the Bills are a touchdown favorite in this game. What is the path? Like, what's if you were to plot the path, if you were to write the script for how Pittsburgh goes into Buffalo and steals this game, what are some of the keys that come to your mind? Top keys for me. I would be looking at one, running the ball to keep the ball out of Josh Allen's hands. If you go back to that last game last year, early in that first half, the Steelers' defense was in control of the game. They were shutting things down, but the offense kept giving the the Bills the ball back. And then eventually, the Bills said, wait a minute. Let's get the ball to the middle of the field. And that was right where the Steelers didn't have their top three inside linebackers were unavailable. And they were trying to to mask that as best they could. And then eventually you saw Stephon Diggs break into the middle of the field where they had no help. And that's where they got picked at. The Steelers now, with those guys in the middle, have to make sure that this defense gives the Steelers offense as much time as possible to figure things out. If they can run the football well, establish that. And like you said, that's not one of the Bills' strengths. That might put them in a, in a position where maybe the Bills start to make, make some adjustments to sell out to stop the run and give Ben Roethlisberger more chances to target guys down the field. That, to me, is going to be a big factor here. Establish the run and, and play off of it. There's going to be a lot more play action in the Steelers' offense this year. They practice 
technically didn't use it much last year. Um, and it's going to be about at that point, then can Ben Roethlisberger make the reads and make the throws? The Steelers haven't had really good quarterback play when they played the Bills in the last two years. They're looking to have that go around. If they can get the run game, decent quarterback play, and the defense not give up uh, you know, the, the middle of the field like they did last year, I think that's the ticket to them you know, hanging in in the fourth quarter and then being able to compete in the final minutes. And as we're keeping it rolling here on the on our locked locked on cross locked on uh, podcast network crossover Thursday between the Steelers and the Bills, we got to talk to you guys about our friends at RockAuto.com. Save time and money when using Rock Auto. Why choose to spend thirty percent, fifty percent, or even hundred percent more for the same parts from a chain store or car dealership? For example, Honda Odyssey fuel pumps are worth three hundred and fifty three dollars in the chain store, but two hundred and sixteen dollars on Rock Auto. Rock Auto is a family-owned business serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years. Rock Auto's prices are reliably low for every customer. They have everything you could need from brake parts to tail lamps to motor oil to even new carpet. Go explore their easy-to-use website today to find the solution for all your auto your, your, your auto part needs. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck and write locked on in there. How did you hear about us, Fox? So that they know that, that, that we sent you. At rockauto.com, they have amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the car parts your car will ever, ever need. Visit rockauto.com today. And of course, we're also brought to you by betonline.ag. It's that time of the year again, and all eyes are now turning to football as teams are back on the gridiron to start the football season. As always, BetOnline is your number one spot for all the pro and college football action this season. Get all the updated odds, props, and contests, including the half million dollar for the NFL Mega Contest and the $200,000 NFL Survivor Contest open right now at BetOnline. Head to the website or order or use your mobile device to sign up today and receive a 100% welcome bonus. Be sure to take advantage of the opening day, which is tonight, Thursday night football for the Super Super promo, make a bet on, on tonight's season opener between the Super Bowl champion Buccaneers and the Dallas Cowboys. And if you lose, your wager will be refunded up to $25. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports from football to basketball to boxing right down to horse racing. Don't wait and take advantage of all the great offers available for the 2021 season at betonline.ag, your online sportsbook experts. Now, finishing out the show here, real quick with my man, Joe. Joe, you're a football guy. You write about NFL draft. You know all these guys. You, you know all these guys before they get to the NFL. Give me, I want I want two sets of matchups. I'll give you one first so you can think about this. But give me, I want to hear from you, a matchup, a matchup that the Bills should really like and a matchup that the Bills should dislike. I'll start with the Steelers and a matchup that, 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 that they should like. And for and for me, I see Najee, or no, excuse me, Najee Harris and Eric Ebron and Pat Fryermuth as intermediate targets in the passing game over the middle of the field. The Bills, fantasy wise, were one of the were, were not one of the best teams in covering the tight in tight ends last year. I see that this is being an option because they re, the Steelers really like Pat Fryermuth, their second round pick out of Penn State. They still like Eric Ebron as a receiving threat, and they're loving to get the ball to Najee Harris in the passing game. And we talked about the running game there, but I see this as a bigger factor in this game because also the Steelers. They know who Tredavious White is. They know how good of a player he is. What's the best way to avoid Tredavious White? Not throw it to the boundary where he's going to be and he might move around at. So an easy way to do this is get to these athletic guys that they have in the middle of the field. Granted, Jermaine Edmonds is still patrolling there. And you still got those safeties we talked about. But I see that as maybe an advantage that Ben Roethlisberger is going to look at to, 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 to take, a, take on that he couldn't take on last year because they didn't feel confident about, about the running backs there. And they still were kind of working with Eric Ebron to see what he has. Whereas this year, they, they're much more comfortable with Ebron and we're hearing all the great things of Pat Fryermuth hence the two touchdowns he threw to in a preseason game so that's my number one there what's your biggest matchup that you like the most to favor the Bills in this game yeah my eyes go to the the rookie left tackle Dan Moore out of Texas A&M and, and Chris mm. I like Dan Moore I had a I had a mid-round grade on him I thought he could be an NFL starter I'm a little surprised that he's a week one NFL starter yeah and so when when you when you Factor that in. I mean, I'm not sitting here trying to tell you that I don't think Dan Moore's a good player and that he can't be a good left tackle, but it's week one, and you're going up against a very experienced and deep defensive end situation for mm -hmm. the Bills. They're rostering six of them, and that includes Jerry Hughes, Mario Addison, longtime pass rushers in the NFL. They have a lot of technique. They know how to get to the quarterback, and then there's a lot of youth in, in Greg Rousseau, the Bills' first-round pick, who had a great preseason. Boogie Basham, their second-round pick. A.J. Epinesa, their second-round pick from last year. F.A. Obata, who they signed from the Carolina Panthers, who had five-and-a-half sacks last year and has a lot of tools and came over from London, and he's you know he's as gifted as you'll find in terms of athletic uh, traits for a defensive end in the NFL. And so when you have that much depth and you have that many different skill sets and you get to attack a rookie left tackle in their first game, 
I think if you're the Bills, you got to be licking your chops at that opportunity. I agree. I mean, when you see a rookie left tackle, left tackle his first game, and you got experienced guys on the defensive front, you're trying to do as I, I would do as many twists, as many stunts, everything to force that guy, that guy to communicate. As long along with the rookie center and and the second year left guard that's right 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 between them, that left side that's going to be a very intriguing matchup there. Now, one matchup I dislike for the Steelers, and I'll avoid that offensive line because because you brought that up. But I will say I am I'd be concerned if I'm the Steelers about those secondary receivers. For the Bills, Emmanuel Sanders, super savvy receiver, getting open. That's why he's been in the NFL so long. That's why the Steelers drafted him way back in 2010. They've always they always liked that about him. He's always been a tough guy. Cole Beasley still a problem in in the slot. And like I said before, Gabriel Davis. I see this as one of the more underrated guys. When I'm in, when I'm in a couple of my super deep fantasy leagues that have like 16 teams in it and all these different positions, Gabriel Davis is one of those guys that I snag and I'm like, no, I, I'm putting him on the side there because I like his talents and I think Josh Allen has the arm to get it to him anywhere he is on the field that's where I see being a, ma a major problem for the Steelers is that you know even if Josh Allen comes out and it's like last year a little bit slower and maybe they, they they have some three and outs and they're still figuring some things out he has weapons this this year and he really had them last year too but he has the weapons that I think he's more comfortable with to say hey we're going to go at this secondary and we're going to pick to see Cam Sutton. How ready are you to be the real, the real number two for this team? James Pierre, are you actually, you know, the way that you played in training camp and preseason? Uh, and then, you know, see if you get Justin Lane gets on the field, if Akella Witherspoon, the cornerback that they traded for from, uh, from the Seahawks, if he gets on the field, test Terrell Edmonds, maybe Trey Norwood's out there. That's where I can see some serious matchup problems in this passing game um, for, for the Steelers and where the bills could capitalize for big points uh, on the, on the flip side. What's a matchup that you dislike that the Bills have to deal with? Yeah, if I can, I'm just going to kind of talk about a unit versus a unit. That's fine. And with within there, there's some there's some serious advantages for Pittsburgh, but it, it's that front seven. It's that Pittsburgh front seven against mm -hmm. the Bills offensive line, and I think the Bills offensive line at center and Mitch Morse and at both tackles and Daryl Williams and Deion Dawkins, rock solid, above average starters. Those guards, they haven't even figured out who the starters are. John oh. Feliciano, you've got Ike Bucker. You've got Cody Ford. They're all talented. They're all capable. They've all started, but neither one of them I would view as above average players. And so they're unsettled, and, and I think that matters a lot, right, when you're talking about being consistent with communication, with pass protection, with uh, with your blocking assignments in the run game. And so when you're going up against tanks, if you will, and Cam Hayward, who is one of the most underrated defensive players in the entire NFL, you've got Tyson Alualu, who is – an absolute tank against the run. Chris Wormley's no slouch. I know they don't have Steph to it, which that's mm -hmm. a big loss for Pittsburgh. Loss. And, and man, he's he's outstanding. He's one of the better defensive playmakers in the NFL as well. Mm -hmm. And then Devin Bush is back. Joe Schobert playing, you know, his running mate now. TJ mm -hmm. Watt, Melvin Ingram, Alex Highsmith. That's a lot that they can challenge you with. And so while I think that the Bills will have a lot of opportunity to dictate that a little bit by making it more of a space game. If the Bills want to have any chance to run the football against this Pittsburgh front seven, I think that's going to be a real challenge, and they'll have to rely on on scheme and you know maybe trying to take advantage of some spacing in the run game because I'm not sure that those guards are going to be able to create movement against those uh, outstanding Pittsburgh front seven defenders. Absolutely. I think it's uh, that's going to be a key matchup. If the Steelers want to win, they have to dominate that matchup and make life a lot harder for Josh Allen by taking control of the trenches and forcing him to win kind of by himself out of the backfield and getting the ball to those receivers where I think that the, the Bills will have will, will have an advantage in matchups. Joe, this is always fun to do these crossovers with you, my man. You know your football like be better than anybody. You out here always, and I think we have some great discussions, man, so it's always fun to do these crossover Thursdays with you. Let the Steelers fans out there know they can find you follow you and get more of your work yeah i appreciate it chris uh, you can find me on twitter at the joe marino locked on bills podcast draft dudes the draftnetwork.com so a lot of football content and you know it was a pleasure talking ball with you again chris and look maybe we'll get to do it again later in january Hey, wouldn't mind that at all because it means we're having some fun, some fun playoff talk here in Pittsburgh. I'm Chris Carter, host of the Locked On Steelers podcast. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Carter Critiques. Remember to check us out on the Locked On Steelers podcast. Just like you get Joe, you can get us on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Odyssey. If you want to subscribe to our YouTube channel, please uh, hit, hit look up Locked On Steelers, hit the subscribe button. It really helps us out. Leave us, but hey, Steelers fans, let's help out the let's help out let's help out Joe with Locked On Bills. Give them five star reviews as well, the way you give us five star reviews. Because you hear how good he is, you hear how knowledgeable. 
responsible he is. We have fun conversations here where it's all love here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Thanks again for listening. Be back in your ears tomorrow, finishing out the week here on the Locked On Steelers Podcast with Jenna Harner. We'll see you then.